Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to talk about the Weill Felix test. The Weill Felix test was developed um, over a hundred years ago by two scientists who realized that they could use a technique that they had developed as a diagnostic test for rickettsial infections. When we say rickettsial infections, we're talking about things like typhus and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So infections caused by rickettsial bacteria. It's a simple and inexpensive test. Um, it is less sensitive than some newer methods like immunofluorescence antibody assays, but because it is so simple and inexpensive to carry out, it is still pretty widely used. So let's talk about the mechanism, how it works. It turns out that there is antigenic cross reactivity between rickettsia species and some proteus species. Let's talk about what this means. So rickettsia is one genus of bacteria that causes diseases like the ones I mentioned earlier, typhus, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Proteus is another genus of bacteria, but it turns out that there's antigenic cross reactivity. What this means is that antibodies that were made by an immune system to recognize and fight rickettsia species can also recognize and bind to some proteus species. And so what um, medical professionals can do is they can make dilutions of patient serum. So the serum being the portion of the blood that contains the antibodies um, and test those against different proteus strains looking for this nonspecific agglutination. The nonspecific here just refers to the fact that they're looking to see if there are antibodies that would be, ha, have been made by an immune system to recognize rickettsia species that can actually recognize the proteus species in the test, resulting in this cross-linking that you see here. So each of these black rods represents um, a proteus bacterium. And the red spikes coming off each of the proteus bacteria, those are to represent antigens. Antigens just meaning something, um, usually like a carbohydrate or a protein on the surface of a bacterium that can be recognized by the antibodies that are here in green. Agglutination is when you get clumping. So when you get lots of these proteus bacteria that are cross-linked, meaning that you've got an antibody that is bound to two proteus bacteria, um, bringing them into close, um, sort of close contact with each other. So when you have all of this cross-linking, these different antibodies, again, those are the Y-shaped molecules shining green, that causes clumping of these proteus bacteria. And the clumping is something that can actually be seen with the naked eye. And that's called agglutination. So just to kind of summarize, if somebody is sick because they're infected with rickettsial species and their body is making antibodies to try to defend them, try to fight off those infections, well, those antibodies will be in the patient serum and a doctor can take the serum, mix it with some proteus and see if agglutination happens. If the proteus is agglutinated, then the doctor can um, can determine that the patient has antibodies in their serum to rickettsia infections, which would mean that they were infected with something like typhus or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the bacteria that caused those. So there are um, two main methods that can be used for the Wild Felix test. That's the slide test and the tube test. The slide test is the simplest, but it's not very quantitative. It involves putting patient serum onto a slide and then adding drops of a proteus bacterial culture and then rotating for one minute. So that just means rotating the slide, like holding the slide and kind of rotating it like this, just so that the serum and the drop of the proteus culture get well mixed. And then you look, if the serum 
is positive, meaning that it has antibodies that have been made against a rickettsial infection, those antibodies will also non-specifically cross-link the proteus, resulting in agglutination, and you'll see sort of some cloudy clumping in the serum. If the serum from the patient does not have agglutination, then it's negative for these antibodies, meaning that that patient um, would not have a rickettsial infection. So that's the slide test. The next is the tube test. It takes longer, but it's more quantitative. This is where a doctor will make dilutions of the patient serum. So here you would have from maybe most concentrated to least concentrated, meaning the most antibodies are gonna be in here, the least antibodies are gonna be in here, and you'll see a spectrum because of a serial dilution. To each one of these tubes, you would add a drop of proteus culture, then incubate for a few hours, four to six hours at 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, and then check for the agglutination, the clumping. The most dilute tube, so that basically the most dilute tube, meaning the, the least concentrated tube, that shows the agglutination gives the antibody titer. So if you look, and this is the most concentrated and it's got agglutination, and this is the second most concentrated, and it's got agglutination, but there's no agglutination here, then this tube right here would be the most dilute tube to show the agglutination, and you would look back at what the dilution was, and that would help you to determine the antibody titer. Um, I do want to point out one more thing, and that is that um, antibodies to different species of rickettsia will be cross-reactive with different species of proteus, which means that you might have to do these tests a few different times using different species or strains of proteus in order to determine um, which kind of rickettsial infection somebody has, if any. So to, um, to screen them for the different types of rickettsial infections, you might have to go through this process a few different times. If you're interested in learning more about how antibodies work, then you can check out my video on antibody structure and function. Um, if you're interested in how these antibodies can be used to test for other kinds of infections, you know, the Wild Felix test is looking at rickettsial infections, but I've got another video on the Sabin-Feldman dye test, which looks at uh, antibodies and uses them to determine if a person has a toxoplasma infection. So you can check out that video if you're interested in that. But that's it for today, and thanks for watching Biology Professor.